Okay, two more for tonight, and I'm going to stop, I promise. But I was a big Dale Earnhardt Biggie fan, drove the three car most of the time. I actually won the rookie of the year in the championship driving the two car. Spent some time before he got into the two car full time for Rod Ostro and driving for different people. Ed Negree, Walter Ballard, Johnny Ray, who passed away recently. And Bud Moore for a couple of years before going back to Childress and tragically ending his career in a three car to 2001 Daytona 500. But these are going to be his 10 toughest wins. Now, again, disclaimer, I've done this before. This is strictly my opinion. And I have a tie for 10th. Okay. Pocono and Talladega, both summer races in 93, and there's a reason for that. Of course, we know he was awful good at Talladega. We know Dale Earnhardt was awful good at Talladega. But the reason for that is Pocono was the first race after Davy Allison was killed in the helicopter crash. The emotion, they actually got out of the car and did a prayer, I believe, led by crewman David Smith, if I remember correctly. And Talladega, the very next week after Pocono, was the first race at Davy Allison's home track. That had to be emotional. So that's a tie for 10. So let's go to number 8. Bristol Spring Race in 79 as a rookie. Very simple. Over the hump. And number 7 and number 6 are kind of over the hump. I could almost call them ties. Sonoma, Sears Point, Infineon, whatever they were calling it back in finally won on a road course, which everybody said he couldn't drive road courses. Not true. In the 80s, ESPN did a, went back and checked average finishes on road course. Now, this was before Gordon and Stewart's time. Well, seems the best average finish, so he hadn't won, was none other than Dale Earnhardt. Number six, Daytona, 4th of July race. Some old-timers like me refer to it as in 1990. As the Firecracker 400. That's another over the hump. Reason being, first Premier Series points, pace, points paying race at Daytona. Finally, I mean, he had just started that February, a string of 10 straight qualifying races. Never lost one in the whole decade of the 90s. 90 to 99, that's 10. Number five, Richmond Spring Race 87. Now, don't sound like that big a deal. But, in a Saturday practice, the throttle stuck and he hit the bowler plate wall or the steel guardrail like he used on highways. Well, rather than go to a backup car and lose their starting position, they were allowed to take the car off premises and repair it and brought it back with zero practice and won the race. In fact, took the car back to the shop, repaired more. They claim it still wasn't right, and it won six out of eight races it ran that year. In fact, it only lost North Wilkesboro with a tire going down in Martinsville when he got dumped by Darrell Waltrip in the process of dumping Terry Labonte and Dale Earnhardt. Number four, the 93 600-mile race. may have been the Coke 600. I'll call it the World 600, being old school. And I was at that race. Well, first they got him for too fast entering, which was a 15-second penalty at the time. They put him a lap down. Then they got Dale Earnhardt for dumping Greg Sachs, which video evidence later proved he didn't do. So, then it, what that did was made him mad. He come out and got his lap back immediately on the restart back when the lap car started on the inside since he was on the lead lap he could pit with the leaders and then they held him but he was already out and they didn't penalize him any further I guess they thought a lap was enough they didn't do anything about Ernie Irvin trying to run him down in the grass as the leader I think it was Irvin but leader tried to run him in the grass and on as we were walking out of the track I think Buddy Baker was on the radio broadcast and said, well, they took Superman's cape and they made him mad or something to that effect. And then back at the hotel, 
Benny Parsons was on one of the local news stations, and he showed that Sachs, Greg Sachs clearly broke loose before Earnhardt got against him. You could see daylight between the cars. Number three, another race I attended. The next to last win, the 2000 Atlanta Spring Race. Now, let me explain some stuff average people might not know, because I had a scanner at that race, of course, listening to Earnhardt, as I usually did. On the first pit stop, they literally changed everything on the car, and I'm thinking. And frankly, by then, we'd gotten used to long days. The children's team was down. And finally, they got the car handled better, somehow stayed on the lead lap. And then teammate Mike Skinner knocks his fender in. And I mean, he's fuming on the radio, threatening to drive Skinner into the grandstands. And I'm on the front row, and I'm thinking, I hope he don't do it. But I know he wasn't going to. But Childress is on there trying to, Richard Childress, Carlin are on there trying to get him calmed down. And finally does. And they get it. And they get back toward the front. And about 20 laps to go. Skinner, team car, same engine, same engine builder, blows an engine. You're thinking, hold your breath for the last 20 laps. See if his makes it. Maybe they got a part that's not going to hold up 500 miles. You got to figure they got the same parts. Of course, the jetting and the carburetor or what have you could be different. You know, different teams have different tuners. Well, of course, then, then he had to beat Bobby Labonte down the line. And frankly, when they went by us off four in the Petty Grandstand, I thought Bobby had him. But he got that good drive off the outside just the same as Harvick did a year later on Gordon. I think I've erroneously said in a previous vlog that Gordon... Or Harvick was driving the same car and hard drove a year before. I think it was confirmed on Facebook. It was not the case, but I'd have to look it up. And but it made for a good story. Number two, many people would consider this number one, but I have a reason for the one I call number one. It was its very last one at Talladega in 2000, with four or five laps to go. Dale Earnhardt 17. Well, somehow he finds the Andy Petrion combo back there of Kenny Wallace and I think Joe Nemechek, but I'm not sure. And, of course, they're back there and they latch on to him. And all of a sudden, up through the middle, it looks like Junior's going to win it at one time. Bobby Obani had been pushing him for a while. And Bobby Obani was worried about points. He'd rather finish than wreck. I think he's willing to push Junior all the way to the win, Dale Earnhardt Jr., but... Then they got by him, and it looked like Skinner might win. Now, I remember my mom, rest her soul, sitting right here in this living room saying, Skinner going to get him one. And I said, hey, better look coming up in the middle. There's a black car cover. She said, you've got to be kidding. I said, no, because I think I spotted it before the TV did. Sure enough, up the middle he comes with the Petri pair pushing him, takes the win, most unbelievable, one of the greatest comebacks from not being laps down. You know. And number one, Bristol Spring Race of 85. Now, why would you say somebody so good at Bristol, in fact, got his first points paying cup win at Bristol, first one in cup period at Bristol six years before this? Why would you say that's a surprise? Well, not that it was Bristol and Dale Earnhardt won. In the first hundred laps of the race, the power steering went out. Now, if you've ever driven a car that the power, and I'm talking the older cars, the newer cars, at least my Cobalt doesn't have power steering fluid. The power steering's actually under the dash. I learned that when it had to go for a recall. Okay. It doesn't have fluid, but if you've ever run out of fluid or before the days of serpentine belt, throw the power steering belt and tried to steer that car, you know what I'm talking about. Well, 500 laps at Bristol. Granted, there were a lot of caution laps, but frankly, it's harder to turn at slower speeds. That had to be as tough as winning. The only other one I know of that won a race, a big an ARCA race with power steering out, was Frank Kimmel of Kentucky. We were up there listening to his radio, and then we kidded him. He come back to the local short track, him and his brother Bill, both that night. This was a Saturday afternoon race. 
and we kidded Frank about being Popeye driving that car with no power steering. Again, we had scanners, but I'm getting off track a little bit. But that's just been strictly my opinion on Dale Earnhardt's toughest wins. Agree, disagree, I don't care. You know, you, it's never bothered me if you dislike a video. Some people may dislike it because they didn't like Earnhardt, but oh well, it don't bother me a bit.